So my name is Adam. I am a, a mere Kirsch uh, teacher assistant, assistant at uh, Tel Aviv University for the course uh, Advanced Topics in Programming. And um, well, we are at um, C++ uh, teaching workshop. Uh, so I'd like to speak a bit about um, practical methods that I've been using in my uh, classes um, to kind of uh, let the students visualize uh, what is happening under the hood um, to kind of um, have a better understanding of uh, C++, uh, of core concepts. Um, okay, so let's, let's uh, begin with some uh, practical examples. Uh, Okay, so this is, this is the kind of uh, interactive uh, um, basic uh, slide that I've been using in my uh, uh, classes. Um, so we can see the, the command line and the simple uh, program. Uh, whenever I, I share a, a program, there's always a link to the code, uh, to an online compiler, so that the students can modify the code and uh, kind of... Um, see for themselves what is happening. I usually use uh, Colero. Um, and of course, whenever I present some sort of uh, functionality or uh, some uh, uh, classes or uh, libraries, I, always, I also include a reference, the CPP reference. Uh, OK, so let's, let's run our simple program. In this case, we're going to visualize a, a command, an example for uh, command line arguments. Uh, so we'll type, the, the, the program is easy, it's a multiplication uh, program. We receive arguments, we're going to type uh, our program, malt and uh, numbers, 2502 and 10. And we're going to see step by step what is happening. Because, um, okay, one of the things that um, I think are a little bit um, hard for students who are beginners with C or C++ is like, is the argv. What exactly is the argv? What is a pointer to a pointer? And uh, so let's see. Okay, so the argv. So the argv has its place, has its address in the memory. But basically, it's a, it's a pointer. It's a, the content is a location, another location in the memory. So then we can speak about this location, and it basically points to an array. An array? of three integers, um, of three pointers. Um, OK, so um, it points to the beginning of the array. And so the first element of the array would be a pointer to the first argument. In this case, the name of the program. So now we can discuss with our students what is a string, what is the representation, what is a car uh, pointer, and uh, what is the terminating null. And so the next element would, of course, be the first number to the uh, program. And then the third would be the second number to the program. Um, with this kind of diagram, we can also show uh, what is the dereferencing uh, operator. What is an asterisk argv? We can see that it's basically the first element of the array of pointers. And what is asterisk argv0? It's basically the first character in the first argument or in the first string. Um, OK, so we can actually visualize this. And um, let's step into another uh, confusing uh, uh, topic for, uh, for beginners. And that is uh, what is really happening in the heap and the stack. Um, what's, what's the relationship between them and how does the program uh, behave. So let's, let's interactively uh, run our program. Um, okay, so we start with our main. So when main starts, in the beginning we have the, the stack frame that belongs to it. So this gray box would represent the overhead of the calling. Could be the return address, but also uh, internal registers that need to be saved across the, uh, the function calling process. Um, so whenever we see this, um, this, this will be the overhead. But then we have the four bytes that are reserved 
uh, for the result for the first integer and that would uh, that would be initialized to zero so we can actually see the the content of these uh, of this uh, integer okay um, so now we step into the next uh, line of the code and now we have a dynamic allocation so what is really happening there so we can introduce the heap and there we have a new array of size 2 and we have uh, 2 and 3 both values are initialized and then in our main we have the pointer uh, to this array so it would simply be again we can see a pointer and uh, we can uh, we can see that it points to this area in the memory um, okay so now we we can understand the relationship uh, between the heap and the and the stack. So now another very important uh, thing that we need to discuss when discussing about uh, heap and stack would be what's happening when we call a function. So in this case, we're going to call this uh, simple function, uh, sum2, that would simply uh, sum the two integers and return the value. OK, so in this case, um, we're going to open a new uh, frame on the stack. A new frame is being opened, the overhead, and then uh, the parameter that is passed to the, the function. Here, we see a new parameter, r, that is simply a bitwise copy of um, the array, the, the pointer. So now we can discuss about uh, bitwise copy, about uh, shallow copies versus uh, deep copies, and I think it's very helpful to see also that. Um, okay, and now, of course, internally, there's uh, memory reserved for this uh, integer total that will hold the sum of the two integers on the heap. Um, so in total, here we have, we created the, the frame uh, on the stack for this function. And then when we return, when we step back into main, of course, it collapses. And we can discuss what's hap what happens if we, uh, let's say, return a reference to something that, it, that was in the function. What happens if we change the value of pointers? Um, so again, I think it's easier to use this kind of, uh, of scheme. Um, I've also included in the, in the lecture notes and also the, the previous slide uh, holds, um, uh, holds the code in, uh, in Colero and compiled, of course, uh, let's say the overhead and uh, the structure changes from one architecture to another and also with different kinds of compilers, let's say the, uh, the order of parameters uh, versus uh, the order of local variables. So. We don't, have to, uh, we don't have to go into these details in the beginning with our students, but I think it's, it's very important to kind of understand um, and be aware that this is uh, architecture dependent and uh, can change. So it, this is, um, I think, the schematic um, option that would be most useful for students in the beginning. And that's why I share it with you. Um, OK. So. Um, so then we step back and result receives uh, uh, is now 5, uh, same as the return value. And then at last, we can go to, the, uh, to this uh, print and we get result onto the screen. Um, OK, so that was this example. And um, now a little short example uh, that was inspired by this uh, code uh, on ISO CPP um, here. Uh, I'd like to also introduce another uh, important concept in C++, and that is the order of creation and order of destruction. And uh, for this, I've used this uh, uh, exposed structure that simply prints within uh, the constructor and the structure and kind of allows us to track what is happening with every key. So when I hit the slide, it represents uh, pressing enter again. So it's also interactive. So our main is very simple. We initialize, we create an object of type derived, and we're going to see what is happening. So in the beginning, of course, 
uh, well derived. Here we have uh, defined a static variable, so the static will be created first. Then we go to the first base. Base zero would be uh, constructed first, and then base one. Then we construct the members of the class. So member zero, then member one, and then we step into the constructor of derived. We print inside, and then the body of main ends, and we start destructing. So at first, we step into the body of the destructor. Then we actually define local variables within the destructor of derived. So here again, we have new constructors. So first, we construct local 0, then local 1, then we exit the body. And so, um, so we start destructing first. And this is another concept that we need to speak with our students, and that is that the destruction is made in a reverse order to the creation. So then destruction of, uh, of uh, local 1, then local 0, then we destruct in reverse order the members, and uh, then we destruct base 1, which is the second in the inheritance list, against reverse order, then base 0, and we can speak about the recursive uh, kind of behavior of uh, the destruction, and last, the static variable that was uh, constructed first. Okay, so this was um, this example of visualizing this. And um, now, so, so another thing that I wanted to share with you today is not just uh, uh, this technique of visualizing, uh, but also um, a set of home assignments that we're giving to students uh, throughout the semester. And um, of course, the credit for this set of home assignments goes to Amir Kirsch. Yeah? And um, okay, I think, I think you also find it uh, brilliant. And um, also, you'll see how this set of home assignments can motivate uh, students to be more invested in their coding and to even enhance their enthusiasm uh, to coding which is also something that we can do as uh, teachers. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start. So the idea of this uh, assignment is we get a maze file. Basically, it's a description of a maze. So a maze has, of course, a start at symbol. Uh, it has a starting point. It has an end point, a treasure. And then it has walls, obstacles, and then the idea is to implement an algorithm that would efficiently solve this maze. So in our case, um, also there's, there's um, a definition of maximum steps that an algorithm can take in order to solve the maze. So, so the idea is that the students will implement um, an algorithm that would solve the maze efficiently and you can maybe notice that the maze is uh, cyclic so if you step uh, from the left side you enter into the right side and from the top to the bottom. Okay, so the problem uh, with this uh, algorithm or why is it harder than it seems is because the algorithm is walking in the dark. It does, is not aware of the measurements of the maze and uh, it, it's not aware of the starting point relative to the maze, of course. And so the students at first, at the first assignment, are requested to uh, implement a game manager. The game manager will receive as an input a maze file, would hold a representation of the maze, and then would use the algorithm through this interface to traverse the maze. So basically, in a nutshell, it would iterate max step times. And with each iteration, it would simply call the algorithm's move method. So then the algorithm would return whether it wants to go up, down, left, right, or even set a bookmark. That cost one step. And I'll leave it for you to kind of uh, think why is it important to even include this bookmark in, the, uh, in this assignment. 
uh, well, okay, so if the move is made into a wall, then the game manager would simply call the algorithm's hit wall method. And that's how the algorithm is notified of hitting a wall. So then the algorithm, if efficient, would know not to step again through the same path. And uh, also, if the algorithm hits the bookmark, he would be notified um, similarly. And uh, so this is the basic concept of the game manager. Um, okay, so this was the first assignment. And then in the second assignment, the students are asked uh, to create a match manager. Now, a match manager would load um, shared objects of various algorithms, of different algorithms. Uh, at first, the, the students are requested to implement the match manager in two algorithms, uh, implemented as SO files. And then the match manager would load those uh, SO files and, of course, would receive an input multiple mazes and then would run each um, algorithm on each maze and, of course, generate a report for how successful those algorithms were. And, uh, of course, uh, the students are requested to uh, support multi-threading and so that this implementation uh, um, can be concurrent. And so uh, why am I uh, presenting this? Uh, well, for the next step. Uh, because um, the next step would be a class competition where every student is requested to submit two algorithms and then the best algorithms in class would receive a bonus to their grade. Um, so this is, um, this is the idea of, uh, and this is why I think, and you can agree, you can uh, really increase the enthusiasm of students to program and uh, that's how they're more invested in their code. Um, that's it. Any questions? Yes. How did you evaluate the exercise? Because just uh, being the fastest is not enough. We also wanted to write a nice code. Well, I mean, the evaluation of the of the the code is first. I mean. There's also a, an evaluation of the code, an evaluation of the design, evaluation and in the beginning, of course, there's uh, input and output and maybe uh, several uh, um, uh, error messages that the students are required to follow. Uh, well, your Dan here uh, has done a great job to, to evaluate uh, students. <laughs> so. Maybe just uh, to see it, it, that it supports uh, yeah, multi-threading. So, so you can check that when they do use multi-threading, they reach the correct output. Yes. So in your slides about the heat and stack visualization, yeah. and do you discuss byte ordering? Because it seems like everything was big at the end in the memory. Um, well, I don't know if you noticed, but the. Uh, Actually, the, the addresses of the heap and the stack are reversed, and the kind of diagram can actually, we can discuss that. I think in the beginning, uh, maybe it's a little bit too much, but uh, 
but yeah, I mean, with this kind of diagram, because I was looking for diagrams when, uh, and I, I couldn't find something that really could grasp everything together. And I think uh, with this kind of building blocks, uh, you can discuss all of that. Yeah. Uh,